Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Tracing the Source of Venus Reflux. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the Questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation and will try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left side of your screen is the Resources tab. Click this tab for links to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the SVU CME credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinars portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Sarah Schonsberg. Sarah is a vascular sonographer at Oregon Vascular Specialists in Bend, Oregon. She is board certified as an RVT and RPHS. She has been studying and researching pelvic venous disorders and working with the American College of Phlebology for the last three years to advance venous ultrasound. And we are happy to have her with us today. With that, I will now turn the webinar over to Sarah Schonsberg. Sarah? Great. Thanks, Kelly. I'm excited to be here today. So we're going to be talking about tracing the source of venous reflux, which is one of the um, best exams I love to do, and I hope that all of you will love it after this presentation and after you go home and try some of the techniques. So just going to start with a little introduction about myself. So I graduated from Seattle University can see my class up here. Um, all of us very proud to be graduating that day. You can also see my husband, Steve, and my dog, Baker. Um, we moved to Bend, Oregon recently. These are just some scenic shots of Mount Bachelor and Smith Rock. Um, Oregon Vascular Specialist is where I currently work. I work for uh, Dr. Wayne Nelson and Dr. Jason Junt, uh, two great vascular surgeons here that um, were developing our vascular practice, and it's been a really exciting time for that. Um, the University of Washington is also pictured here. That's where I've worked for the last four years and really where I began all of my venous work um, under Dr. Mark Meisner, so I always have to give him a big thank you for that. Um, but let's get started. So this is my favorite case. Um, I know that most of you will be looking at your screen like this right now, um, but this is why I love venous scanning. I love venous scanning because it's so different every single time you set down the probe. I love that you can map these venous pathways and you can really figure out the unique hemodynamics of every patient that you scan. And we're actually going to come back to this case in a little bit. So most of you in your practice now, you probably see a varicose vein scan on your list and you say, oh no, this is a tedious exam. It's time consuming. You often feel like it will lack direction, and patients have high variability and difficult to predict patterns. They can be frustrating and an ergonomic nightmare. So I'm hoping that I can alleviate some of this nightmare for you and make this a little bit more fun. So why should we care? So I'm going to turn this question into a case study because I recently had a 63-year-old man come into my practice. Um, who had bilateral varicose veins. He had symptoms of itching, heaviness, night cramping, and edema. On clinical examination, he 
on his right lower extremity, he had varicose veins on the calf and he had coronaflavic cadia. On the left lower extremity, he also had varicose veins on the calf, coronaflavic cadia, and hemosiderosis, excuse me, and healed ulceration as well. This is an image of coronaflavic cadia. So we see the spider veins, blue reticular veins all along the heel um, and ankle. And that's really that uh, lowest point of pressure. So we see that um, spray of varicosity is just right at where gravity is pulling on that venous system the most. His left leg presented very similar to this. Um, and you can see that he has hemo hemosiderosis and a healed ulcer. We can see the uh, healed ulceration here, the skin that's scarred, and then we can see the discoloration in the gator territory on the medial ankle, um, this brownish, brawny discoloration here. So I introduced the SEEP classification here because I think it's really an interesting classification system, and I think it's something that stenographers should be familiar with when they're dealing with varicose vein patients. So the SEEP classification is a clinical severity score. So it's a score that providers can give patients based on what they see um, throughout the examination. And we can see that our patient that we just discussed is anywhere between a C3, C4, and then a C5 on the left lower extremity. So my question for this patient was, what was missing? This patient told me that he's had multiple venous treatments at outside facility, and he was told that he would need venous treatments every two to three years, which seemed excessive. So why after bilateral radiofrequency ablation, stab phlebectomies, and foam sclera therapy, does this patient have a recurrence of his varicosities and significant C5 disease? Did anyone catch this? So because his left lower extremity has much more severe disease than the right lower extremity, we want to think about a May Lerner syndrome or a left common iliac compression syndrome or even a left external iliac vein um, compression as well. So we want to think about that iliac pathology or that proximal source for the severity of the left side versus the right side. So what did I do? At this point, with my patient, I did screen for uh, with transabdominal duplex ultrasound for an iliac vein obstruction. Of course, I did this with the blessing of my vascular surgeon and with my ordering provider's permission. Um, but I just wanted to take a quick second because this became relevant in this case to talk about the transabdominal criteria for compression. And I think that it's really interesting when we actually look at what's out there. The only published criteria for iliac vein obstruction is a 2.5 times velocity increase at the point of compression. There is no validated diameter criteria for the iliac veins. And I think it's really difficult to think about a diameter measurement of the iliac veins just because we know that an iliac segment in transverse is not going to be round like an artery. It can be often squished, oblique. We can get these shots in all different shapes and sizes, so our diameters become unreliable. And really, is ultrasound limited in its benefit for diagnosing compressions in the pelvis? And I think that this is a really important thing to recognize because transabdominal ultrasound is not perfect, of course, and we have heavily relied on it to rule out venous compressions in the pelvis, but I don't know that it's necessarily catching all of these patients, at least the symptomatic ones. Um, and I think IVIS is uh, a perfect, imperfect system. Of course, it's directly in the vein. It can measure the elliptical diameter of each venous segment to determine how much of a diameter uh, reduction it is. But at the same time, it can overdiagnose these patients. And that brings me to my last point about iliac compression is that if there's a compression there, should it be treated? I thought that um, it was a really wise statement that I heard a physician say that we treat the patient and not the imaging. Uh, we treat patients for symptoms and we don't treat them for what we find on imaging. Otherwise, we do a lot of unnecessary procedures. Um, and I think that we have to be careful with the iliac system in that sense. 
around 30% of the population is going to have some sort of iliac um, obstruction, but with their advanced collaterals, sometimes it won't affect them clinically. Okay, so back to the leg. So instead of getting overwhelmed with the details of my patient's prior procedures, I'm going to start my duplex with an open mind and a blank slate. I'm going to go step by step, and I'm going to tell myself to not get worked up about time. I know that's very difficult to do. Um, and to not get, if I get too involved with one leg, that I can stop and reschedule the contralateral extremity. And this really is going to take really good communication between you and your providers at your office. Make sure that you let them know, hey, this is a really complicated one. I wanted to take my time. I think we should reschedule the leg and we're going to get a better exam if we reschedule the contralateral extremity. So where do I start? Always rule out DVT. So we're always going to rule out DVT. We're going to rule out that deep venous obstruction because some of these superficial veins that we see can be collateral pathways. And I think that it's really um, important to make sure that chronic post-thrombotic changes in the deep venous system um, are not the source for our superficial varicosity. So remember this patient that we had? So we can see that if we removed her varicosities, and these are visible bulging varicosities on this patient's thigh, um, if you didn't do an ultrasound, you would just see those and do a phlebectomy or foam sclerotherapy in that area, and this patient would be in a world of hurt. She would be worse off than she started, and her ulceration would just get worse because those are actually not refluxing veins. They're collateral pathways out of her leg. So you can see um, in the top here that there is a Maytherner compression, so a left common iliac compression, um, and a occlusion of the left external iliac vein. Then her deep system, her common femoral vein and main bifemoral popliteal vein were all retrograde. These were veins were retrograde and leading to the superficial system. Um, as I mapped down her leg, I saw a large perforator at the mid-thigh that led to the varicosities on the medial leg, and then they ended up becoming cross-pelvic collaterals and going into the right iliac system. So if this patient's um, veins on her thigh were taken out, it would take out that entire collateral pathway, and her ulceration would probably get worse. So after we've ruled out deep venous thrombosis, we're going to map it out. And you all guessed it, and you're all sitting in horror right now, but we're going to do this while standing. Um, another part of the IAC standards that changed this year is to make sure that we put our patient in a dependent position. So we're standing patients that can stand during this exam. I'm going to show you my setup. So um, this is a setup that I had at the University of Washington. You can see um, the Hokanson cuff inflator. Um, there are many pneumatic cuff inflators on the market, and I've heard great things about all of them. Hokanson is just the one that I happen to be familiar with. Um, you can see the foot pedal on the ground just next to the little doctor's stool. Those doctor's stools are really nice because they go up and down. They provide you a little bit more flexibility with how low your uh, seat can go uh, as to not create a whole lot of bending during the exam and improving your ergonomics. I also put the bed railing up on the bed so that the patient has something to hold on to during the exam. Um, a lot of people get uh, nervous about standing their patients because of vasovagal response and because they're worried about their patient passing out during the test. Um, I'll tell you that you'll, you're going to notice when your patient is starting to go that way. Um, they fidget a little bit. You're going to look up at their faces. They're going to start to be a little bit losing the color in their face. Um, some of them even get a little nauseous. If that happens, you just want to uh, release that bed rail and have them sit down right away. You can get them some water, pause your test, and then have them restand. Um, if you do have patients pass out, then of course you're going to halt the exam and make sure that they're safe before you continue anything else. So these are pictures of me scanning. So you can see um, the foot pedal and you can see that I'm scanning the thigh and I'm really reaching a little bit too much here. I should have scooted my stool closer to my patient so that I didn't have as far of a reach 
I made sure that my keyboard is lowered down and my screen is lowered down to my eye level so that I'm not straining my neck. Um, and of course, all of you are looking at this and say, well, yeah, of course, you can have good ergonomics because you're on the thigh. What happens when you go down to that calf? You're going to be leaning over to that calf. So um, I went ahead and built a stand. So this is uh, me demonstrating our varicose vein stand. Um, we have one at the University of Washington and we're building one at uh, Oregon Vascular. And this stand, I have to give credit to Bill Schroeder in Florida um, out of Quality Vascular. He really is the one that came up with the specs for this and sent me the um, uh, guidelines for it. And it's been a great stand. So it's easy to get around. It's made out of um, plastic that was used for boats. So it's a light plastic and you can actually move it from room to room pretty easily. We put uh, wheels on the end of it so that it can be um, tipped on its side and moved around. And then our clinical engineering department um, tested it out for patient safety and then rated it for a weight. So um, I think that it's definitely something that you can build and you can get around. So if you feel like you're having ergonomic trouble and there's not something on the market, um, be like Bill and just go out and create your own. So what are typical sources of uh, varicosities on the lower extremity? So these are our saphenous sources, and most of us are familiar with these already. Our great saphenous vein, small saphenous vein, anterior accessory great saphenous, and posterior accessory great saphenous. And then we have the posterior arch or posterior accessory saphenous vein in the calf. The saphenofemoral junction is highly variable, um, and I really like these images. Uh, to show the variability of all of the different branches at the saphenofemoral junction. Um, we all know that these branches are good to uh, pay attention to. They become very important when guiding laser ablation uh, because they help wash the edge of the proximal thrombus, avoiding that thrombus extension into the common femoral vein. Um, I do have to thank my friend Joe Zygmunt, um, for loaning me these pictures out of his Venus ultrasound text in practical phlebology. And this is a really good text if you're looking for something about venous anatomy. I think that one of those things that I felt like I really understood venous anatomy, and then I picked up this book and read Joe's chapter and realized, oh, I don't really know anything about venous anatomy, and I learned so much more from it. So it's really, very really well written if you ever want it, another text to pick up. So the great saphenous vein um, is from ankle to groin, and it runs slightly anterior on the tibia bone, slightly posterior on the medial knee, and on the medial thigh to confluence with the common femoral vein at the saphenal femoral junction. 16% um, of patients are going to have a tretic segment of uh, great saphenous at the knee. Um, and then when we look at the variability of the great saphenous, about 70% of patients are going to have that continuous great saphenous from groin to ankle. The remaining 30% of the patients are going to have a hypotrophic or absent segment at the distal thigh or proximal calf. And I also think it's interesting to note here the um, differing origins of the um, posterior arch vein or posterior accessory saphenous vein in the calf. The anterior accessory saphenous vein um, can be a source of primary reflux um, and can be a source of reflux post-intervention. So oftentimes it's associated with the saphenofemoral junction, but often it can also have its own origin off of the common femoral vein. And I think that one of the um, most interesting things um, that I've learned is the alignment sign. So it's a really helpful tool when you're scanning if you're on a superficial vein and you just decrease your depth, if you see it align here in this image with the femoral system, then you know that it's that anterior accessory branch. The posterior accessory saphenous vein um, was previously known as the posterior arch vein in the calf, um, and it joins the great saphenous in the calf and can be associated and very important to note with ulceration. So, can be associated with those posterior tibial perforators and something that we really should be looking for when we have patients with ulceration. Circumflex veins. So these veins um, run oblique to the saphenous compartment. 
and you have an anterior thigh circumflex and a posterior thigh circumflex vein. Uh, the posterior thigh circumflex vein can be the proximal end of the vein of Giacomini um, if it connects with the small saphenous vein. And another term for uh, veins that connect between the small and great saphenous vein um, is an intersaphenous vein as well. The small saphenous vein has three different presentations. The first two points are going to be 75% of the population, and the third is going to be 25% of the population. So 75% of the population is going to have some connection with the saphenal popliteal junction or the popliteal vein. It might be a hypoplastic segment, so it might just be a very small joining of the saphenal popliteal junction, and then the patient will also have thigh extension up the um, posterior thigh, and about 25% of the population is going to have no connection with the popliteal vein at all, and you'll just be following the small saphenous vein into the posterior thigh, never seeing it join with that popliteal. The lateral or accessory small saphenous vein runs in its own fascial compartment, lateral and parallel to the small saphenous vein, and it becomes very symptomatic. So these patients can have um, extreme pain in this area because of its close connection with the common perineal nerve. So let's go back to our case study. So now that we've ruled out DVT, found out that he's negative, let's see what superficial system he actually has left after his previous procedures. So this is what I found. So you can see he has a short segment of great saphenous vein left at the saphenofemoral junction on the right side. This was about 11 centimeters. And then I didn't see a native great saphenous vein in the thigh until I came down to about the mid calf and ankle. The small saphenous vein on the posterior calf on the right side was intact. Moving on to the left leg. I was not able to identify any great saphenous vein at all through this leg. Um, I also was able to identify a small saphenous vein just in the proximal calf, but not in the mid to distal calf. So if he doesn't have saphenous veins in this leg, we have to think about atypical sources or non-saphenous sources of reflux. We're going to look at perforators and deep venous incompetence possibly pelvic leak points or sciatic nerve varicose veins, and popliteal vein compression syndrome. So perforating veins, um, some of you that went to school in the era that I did, you learned Dobbs, Boyd's, and Cockett's perforators, um, which have now had update, updated nomenclature based on their location. So we have the femoral canal perforators, which were previously Dobbs, paratibial perforators, previously Boyd's, and posterior tibial perforators, which were previously cockets. Uh, we also have gluteal perforators that are important. Um, and incompetent perforators can be the primary source of the varicosities, and they can also be really important to note um, in areas of skin changes and ulceration. The thing that I think is most important when thinking about perforating veins is to think about whether it's a source or an exit point. So, and this is when we're just going to be thinking about gravity and fluid dynamics. So, a perforator that's proximal in the thigh and that is at the origin or the start of the varicose veins on the thigh, the most proximal place for those varicose veins on the thigh, is most likely a source. If you follow all of those varicose veins down in the calf and they all end at a perforator and a lot of patients are going to have point tenderness at this perforator. They're going to point right there and say, this is where all my pain is, or you're going to see a bulge on the leg there. This is often an exit perforator. And this is where all of that superficial reflux is going down the thigh, re-entering that deep venous system to try to recirculate into the body. And I think that that's a really important concept to think about because if that exit perforator gets treated, those varicosities have nowhere to empty to, and then that patient could have superficial venous thrombosis and end up in a worse condition. So pelvic congestion syndrome um, is definitely a hot topic right now. And I forgive me, anyone that's in the audience that knows me, uh, pelvic congestion syndrome is kind of a dirty word, and it's not something that I like to use. However, I do think it's something that we have to recognize, that most people recognize 
this as pelvic congestion syndrome and the terminology we're trying to update so that it's pelvic venous disorders and not pelvic congestion syndrome. Um, pelvic congestion syndrome is kind of an outdated term that came from the um, congestion that was created in the pelvis, pelvis from women wearing corsets. And we're really talking about a venous system anomaly, and we want to describe what's actually going on physiologically in the pelvis. So pelvic venous disorders is really what we should be um, aiming to call this. Anyway, um, symptoms, patients can have symptoms in the abdomen and pelvis that lead to varicosities on the leg. And so oftentimes, kind of cluing into that um, pelvic venous disorders is going to really be symptom-based. Your patient might describe vulvar varicosities, perineal varicosities, um, hemorrhoids. They might have um, pelvic fullness or heaviness, and they may be asymptomatic. You may be tracing varicose veins on the leg. And I know probably the ones of you that have scanned a lot of varicose veins, you've done this, where you're scanning along the thigh, proximal, 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 and you go into Neverland. So, I really think this diagram is very helpful um, to look at to kind of tell where these varicosities are coming from. So I point or inguinal point here um, that is fed by the round ligament vein and often leads to connections with the saphenofemoral junction. And if you point your probe transverse from the saphenofemoral junction proximally superiorly into the pelvis, you'll often see those varicosities from I point. P point or perineal point is fed by the pudendal vein and can be linked with vulvar, perineal, and scrotal varicosities. O point or obturator here, kind of in between perineal and inguinal point on the lower extremity, can be linked with the saphenofemoral junction as well, but it's more likely connected with the deep venous system and the common femoral vein. Gluteal point, often on the gluteal muscle, um, can have superior and inferior gluteal leak points. The superior can be linked with the small saphenous vein, and the inferior can be linked with sciatic nerve varicosity. This is just a venogram shot. You can see the internal iliac um, reflux here in the pelvis, and then you can see going down the leg. So as you're injecting dye in the pelvis, we see that leak point. So we see that proof of that varicose vein coming from that pelvis and down onto that posterior thigh. Sciatic nerve varicosities. So this is one where you're really going to look for clinical signs and symptoms. So your patient is going to describe numbness, tingling. They're going to have that um, kind of electric shock or nerve pain that we've all heard them describe. And no longer can we tell them oh, that's not a vein or artery problem. You need to go to a spine doctor. Um, it certainly can be a vein problem, and I think it's something that we need to be aware of. Um, I find that the most helpful thing is to know the anatomy of the sciatic nerve, so know the way that it comes down the posterior thigh, kind of in the arc there, and then to use the tibial nerve in the popliteal fossa to identify that sciatic nerve in the thigh. So we're going to come in a transverse view here, and we're going to look at our popliteal vein, popliteal artery. Just above that is our posterior tibial nerve, and then we have our common perineal nerve on the side here. And we're going to follow that proximally. So as we follow that proximally up the thigh, we're going to increase our depth, and we're going to follow that into a larger nerve fiber, which is the sciatic nerve. You can have an up and down color box along this, um, and you're going to have a low scale, and you're going to augment as you go up. And oftentimes, you'll see these veins light up in that nerve space, and they can be surrounding the nerve, or they can be inside of the nerve. Um, and you'll be able to just kind of see those little veins lighting up and creating that um, reflex in that nerve space. Popliteal vein compression syndrome. So this is something that's typically been seen in the obese population. These patients are usually going to present with ulceration, and they'll present with ulceration um, on the medial ankle, and that ulceration oftentimes gets worse with a venous ablation. And when we think about this, we think about it as it's creating an outflow obstruction. So just like an iliac obstruction creates an outflow obstruction for the lower extremity, 
this popliteal vein compression syndrome is going to create an outflow obstruction for the calf. So when a patient hyperextends their knee, they're actually they're, um, going to compress their popliteal vein from their gastrocnemius muscles, from that popliteal space having too much um, or not enough space to allow for that gastrocnemius compression and that popliteal vein to exist. On ultrasound, you can see the example here of the elliptical diagram where you examine the patient with a soft knee in A and in B is with the leg hyperextended. So I have my patient standing, I turn them um, away from me, and I put a transverse probe in the popliteal fossa, and I have them have a very soft knee, so just a slight bend in that knee. Then I ask them to slowly, slowly stand straight to lock their knee and hyperextend their knee, um, creating that gastrocnemius compression. And then that's actually going to decrease the popliteal space. And you'll watch that popliteal vein disappear. Um, you don't necessarily need to use the ellipse like in these examples, but you can use an AP diameter to look for this. And you just want to make sure that um, you're looking for aliasing or um, sometimes that popliteal vein will go completely away. Most of these patients um, are going to end up just being counseled to lose weight. Uh, they say if they lose 10% of their weight or more, then they will release this compression. Um, but at the same time, I have heard of some fascial clipping surgeries and surgeries that create more um, space in the popliteal fossa. And these patients are typically patients that have some sort of knee remodeling, um, if they have a knee injury and their popliteal space gets changed for whatever reason, then they certainly can have popliteal vein compression syndrome. Um, we also should be aware that there's some sort of nerve entrapment in this area as well. Because of those tibial nerves that we looked at in the sciatic nerve image, those nerves can also get compressed and the patient will often feel nerve pain from that compression here as well. So let's go back to our case so now that we know all the typical sources and we know the atypical sources for varicosities, we've ruled out DVT and we've mapped the superficial vein that's present. Now we have to follow or source the varicosities on the leg. Okay, I'm going to use the pen tool here and try to draw these varicosities. So um, I noticed on this man's thigh that he had varicose veins all along his medial thigh. And I noticed that I could trace all of them up to a refluxing segment of gray saphenous vein that was left over. So this is just refluxing here. So as I'm following these varicosities, I realized, okay, while well, these are tracking down onto the medial calf as well, and the major source for all these varicose veins on the medial thigh and medial calf is that 11 centimeter segment of gray saphenous vein at the saphenofemoral junction that's left over. Then I turned my patient around and I noticed that he had some varicosities on the lateral calf and lateral thigh. So I'm going to start following those. And as I followed them up the posterior thigh, I realized that they went medially and they actually came over and connected with this cluster of varicosities on the medial thigh. Then I turned my attention to the small saphenous vein. And the small saphenous vein was refluxing in the proximal segment with some varicosities on the posterior calf as well. So how do I keep track of this while I'm scanning? So I take these crazy notes. Um, and there's a couple different ways to handle this. So my surgeons just know me and they know to skip over these weird notes because they know I'm going to write up in my report where the varicosities are coming from. But um, I take these notes so that I know exactly where I'm looking. So here we have a left varicosine on the proximal thigh from varicosities on the anterior accessory gray saphenous vein and a perforator in the proximal thigh. So I know when I go back to my desk, I can both draw these on a diagram and I can write them up in my report. Here I have right posterior calf 
at me varicosities that come from the mid GSD. And usually I annotate either thigh or calf here. Down below, I have right great saphenous proximal thigh is just a cluster of varicosities. This means I couldn't identify the great saphenous vein in the proximal thigh, and it was just a cluster of varicosities there. Um, you know, and this is just my way of taking notes and annotating this. The point is for you to come up with your own way. Whatever works for you is fine. And I've seen people take in diagrams and write on the leg while they're doing it. Um, people take notes uh, on pieces of paper in the exam. Whatever works for you is fine. This is just one of the ways that I use. So on his left lower extremity, um, I noticed that at the saphenofemoral junction, I was looking for great saphenous vein, and all I saw was a large cluster of varicosities. And these varicosities went superior to the saphenofemoral junction, and they went inferior to the saphenofemoral junction. So this even further tells me that there's something going on in the pelvis. So there's something coming from that inguinal leak point, and that he probably has some sort of proximal or central obstruction that needs to be thought of. Um, so the, media, the medial side varicosities are from that groin, possibly the pelvis. We won't know until he has further imaging. Then, as I was looking on the calf, he had medial calf varicosities, and I followed those proximally up the calf and into a perforator. So there was an enlarged perforator just about here on the proximal calf. Um, and then these varicosities went to the posterior calf here and down the back of his leg. So this was my final diagram for him. You can see the um, varicosities on the right lower extremity come from that main source is the 11 centimeter segment of great saphenous vein that was left over. Um, getting my laser pointer here. And then we had some lateral calf varicosities, which came from the same cluster. And we had some small saphenous reflux with varicosities on the posterior calf. On the left leg, uh, we had varicosities in the groin that uh, probably come from a proximal source or a central source. And then we had thigh varicosities from that cluster. We had a perforator on the left calf with varicosities coursing down and eventually joining the small saphenous vein, which was pretty much non-existent from that mid to distal calf. So what if I can't find the source? So of course, we're not perfect. Um, ultrasound is not always going to be able to find the source of varicosities. The vein is going to get too small to follow. Um, you're not going to be able to uh, figure out exactly where it's coming from. Maybe a perforator is too deep and shadowed for you to see it. Um, that's fine. I think that that's a really valuable diagnosis. I think that the patient will end up keeping their normal saphenous veins. And um, we want to make sure that those saphenous veins are never ablated unless they have confirmed reflux with a patient in a standing position. You have to report the findings as you see them. You can't change them. Um, and you can use different tools. So now the provider can go to venogram or IVIS. Uh, they can examine the pelvis for proximal obstructions. Um, and they can counsel the patient on recurrence and try floor therapy and phlebectomy procedures. So now I'm hoping that all of you are going to feel like this when you see a varicose vein exam on your schedule and you'll be able to source reflux using all of these tips and tricks that I've given you and all of these uh, typical and atypical sources that you know. Um, I just want to thank everyone today for coming out and I want to thank all of the leaders that um, I've been following in. I've been following in the footsteps of giants for sure. Um, this is the crew at ACP. Um, Bill and Jeannie and Marisa Houle have been uh, all very helpful in uh, educating me clinically. In Linda Antonucci um, is sitting on the ultrasound committee with me this year and has been an incredible, valuable source for me. Um, the American College of Phlebology has really just helped me connect with all of these great stenographers and create all of these educational relationships for me. And I think it's so great. So um, this year, our annual Congress is in Nashville, Tennessee, and you should come and join us and have conversations about veins, be vein nerds with us. 
This is Dr. Mark Meisner. He um, is has been invaluable to my training. He's the one that really got me involved with the American College of Phlebology, and so I always have to thank him. I put my team at the UW in the center here. I miss working with them every day, um, but they taught me everything I know about ultrasound, not only everything um, I know about veins. So they really kicked off this fabulous career that I've started. Um, And thank you to the SVU and the IAC for having me today and putting on this um, valuable topic. And thanks to Oregon Vascular for letting me continue my educational pursuits and um, remaining in this Venus world. And uh, the, I have to thank the CCI also for putting on the RPHS exam. I encourage all of you to take a look at that and really um, buff up your Venus knowledge. It really helps you uh, become a better Venus stenographer. So thank you so much for having me. Okay, great. Thank you. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC, I'd like to introduce Marge Hutchison, Director of Accreditation for Vascular Testing and Vein Center. Marge will assist with the Q&A session today. Marge, would you like to start us off? I would. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Sarah, for just a, an amazing uh, webinar. You, you've given us so much information. Uh, so we have some questions here. Uh, the first question is, uh, you talked just very briefly about May Thurner, and some people would like to know when they're doing a study, what's the indication either on the Doppler or the imaging to suggest that so that they know and should proceed in a different direction? That's a, a really, really good question. So um, I think that traditionally we all thought about waveform changes during our lower extremity venous exam or waveform changes. Um, that pointed to a proximal compression. So, of course, if there is continuous flow in the left common femoral vein, we're going to want to look up at the pelvis and make sure um, that there's nothing going on up higher in the iliac system. But that doesn't always rule it out. So, if we only use waveforms, we're going to miss about 30% of these compressions. And so, it's important to include iliac segments if patients present with symptoms. So um, left leg swelling or edema, um, some people have fullness of their thigh um, and just kind of describe that. In in the case that we presented today, the patient had ulceration. He had much more advanced venous disease on his left leg than he had on his right leg. Um, And I think Anytime that there's an asymmetry, we have to think about um, the iliac system as well. And I do know labs that include the um, IVC iliac system every time they scan a leg. They make sure that they rule it out. So sometimes I think that can be overkill, but I do think that we have to pay attention to more than just waveform. All right. Thank you. Um, We have quite a few people that are very interested in the amount of time it takes you to do these very detailed uh, venous studies. And do you do to this detail on every case that you do? Um, I I do. I I think that it's important to be incredibly detailed when you're doing these. This is the only source of imaging that these patients have before treatment. And that's something that we need to take really seriously. Um, we give two hours for our exams. I know that um, a lot of that is reporting time for me. I probably can scan it in 60 to 90 minutes. Um, the rule out DVT portion is pretty quick. The mapping procedure should be pretty quick. You're just rolling down the saphenous fascia and seeing where you see each superficial segment. And then you're following your varicosities. And I think where people end up spending extra time is documenting, like some people have told me, oh, I have to go through the leg and document every perforator. And that's that's not true at all. You need to pay attention to the perforators, but once you understand the hemodynamics of the leg and you understand whether a perforator is a source or an exit point, you just need to be marking the incompetent perforators, the perforators that are the source of the varicosity or at the site of skin changes or ulceration. And I think that, you know, practice makes perfect, obviously. So the more you do, the faster you'll get. Um, But we do allow two hours in our facility just to allow for reporting time as well for a bilateral study, an hour for a unilateral. 
So someone uh, is asking about, you mentioned about doing a study for deep vein thrombosis to begin with, but what about, do you test for reflux in the deep veins? And if you do, what, what do you do about it? How do you report it? Those kinds of things. Yeah, so um, I do my rule at DVT just like I would do any rule at DVT. I'm doing that in a reverse Trendelenburg position just so that I'm not standing the patient um, as long, I guess. And then I stand my patient. I do know people that do their standing exams. They do their rule out DVT standing. I find it a little bit difficult. Um, so I stand my patient after I've done my rule out DVT, and I do a quick assessment for deep venous uh, reflux at that point. And so I just sample the common femoral vein, the femoral vein, popliteal vein, um, and tibial veins. And I'm looking for um, one second of reflux in the femoral popliteal system and half a second of reflux in the tibial system. Um, and just report that as significant reflux. Um, and then most patients are treated with compression. So, But I think that uh, it's an interesting thing to think about the overload on the venous system. And oftentimes when we find deep venous reflux and very significant um, or lots of segments of superficial venous reflux after their superficial venous reflux is treated, their deep venous reflux gets less severe. All right. Um, here's a million-dollar question. Um, why are you standing the patient if reflux is shown with steep reverse Trendelenburg? Yeah, thank you for uh, bringing that up. So, um, I think one of the most important designations between reverse Trendelenburg, supine, and standing is that in reverse Trendelenburg, we can get bo both false positives and false negatives. So even though you're getting reflux in the reverse Trendelenburg position, that's not the point of the exam. The point of the exam is not to find reflux. It's reflux is to adequately diagnose the patient accurately diagnose where those segments of reflux are coming from. So standing the patient is the only way to do that. Putting that actual pressure on the valve and creating that um, hemodynamic uh, and uh, um, physiological uh, pressure on the fluid column. Uh, because I've, I've had an 11-year-old girl that was completely normal um, in every way, and she had reflux in every superficial and every deep vein in reverse Trendelenburg. When you stood her, she was completely normal. So I think it's really the false positives that are going to get you in the reverse Trendelenburg position. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so um, someone here is inquiring regarding the case study that, that you kind of uh, followed throughout your presentation. What was the end result with that patient? What, what did they have done? What kind of treatment? That's a really good question, and I'm actually waiting for the IVIS results for this patient. So he's scheduled to have his um, venography study uh, in his abdomen and his IVIS. Um, the reason being is that when we did the transabdominal duplex, we saw some compression of the iliac system, um, but not. Uh, I did not get the 2.5 times velocity increase. Now, I've had this conversation with a few different providers, and I think that the, the duplex ultrasound criteria that we have is just kind of not adequate right now. And so I think clinically, this patient needed the venogram, and he needs to move on to a more advanced stage of imaging, and that's what our providers felt as well. And so he's going to end up getting his um, imaging, and then he's going to have treatment of his lower extremity varic varicosities after we... Um, determine whether his um, iliac system is compressed. Well, that poor man has a lot to do. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, some people are asking for a little bit of clarification uh, regarding the alignment sign that you uh, mentioned. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So the alignment sign is um, primarily used to identify the anterior accessory great saphenous. And what it's used for is if you increase your depth when you're on a superficial vein and transverse and you are aligned with the femoral vein, you will see um, the femoral vein just right in line with that superficial system and you know that that is the anterior accessory. So it's just for identification of the anterior accessory saphenous vein. All right. Thank you. Um, 
Again, uh, somebody would like some clarification regarding the veins that surround the sciatic nerve. Mm -hmm. um, so the sciatic nerve veins um, are really a pelvic leak point um, coming from that gluteal perforator or, or that gluteal uh, pelvic escape point. And those veins are going to either course within, excuse me, within the sciatic nerve or around the sciatic nerve and the reflux within that or the inflammation caused by that incompetence of those veins is going to irritate the sciatic nerve and create sciatic pain. So um, the best way that I've found to identify those is going into the popliteal fossa in a transverse plane, identifying the tibial nerve just above the popliteal vein and following it proximally up the posterior thigh with a transverse um color box with an up and down color box and a low scale and then augmenting all the way up. And you can just follow the bright striations of the nerve looking for those sciatic nerve varicosity. All right. Um, thank you. Um, Sarah, this, this is a good question coming up um, that I, uh, I'm, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about it personally. Um, so you have uh, spoken about a very detailed uh, venous reflux case here. Now, do you think that if the patient is seen just in a standard vascular lab, they should get this detailed of a procedure? Or are these detailed procedures specific to vein centers or people that are going to do venous intervention? Um, I think, yeah, that, that is a really interesting question. I, I think that if you're doing reflux exams, they should be detailed and then they should be accurate. And I think that doing a, um, you know, if, if they're seen in a, a standard vascular center that's not going to treat their varicose veins, then I don't think they should be having a reflux study there. They could have a real VVT there and then have to move on, but I think that that would end up putting the patient through more testing than they actually need. Um, and if you feel like your center is not equipped to do these kinds of studies, then they probably shouldn't be done at all. I think that um, mapping the varicosities, yes, it is a very detailed procedure and coming up with the um, sources of the varicosities prior to treatment is so important. Um, I don't know. There could be a place for possibly a um, shortened uh, reflux yes or no question. And, you know, people like Tom Rook have um, some physiologic uh, methods. You could go into venous physiology methods like using um, strain gauge plethysmography and things um, to just qualify a patient for compression maybe if they're not interested in surgical intervention or um, procedural intervention on their varicosities. Um, but I do think that if you're going to do the duplex, it should be detailed. Great. Thank you. Um, here's another uh, question. We, we just can't convince people to um, stand. And this, this uh, person is saying that their patient table tilts to a 70 degrees. And what's the, what's the difference between 70 degrees reverse Trendelenburg and standing? You know, and I, I think that's going to be highly debated until we really have good data. So, um, you know, there is no data saying what, what degree of reverse Trendelenburg is equal to standing. And that's why myself, I do all my exam, exam standing just because that's the only validated way currently. If someone wants to go out there and figure out exactly what degree a reverse trend Ellerberg table is equivalent to standing, fabulous. I think that, that that's a great study that should be done. It's something that should be looked into. There was a paper that was published in JVU um, I believe a couple of years ago about um, reverse Trendelenburg and changing the criteria, changing the reflux time a little bit. Um, and that's possible too. I think that we can think about changing that uh, criteria to create better ergonomics. I, I personally have just found the stand um, that, it, that Bill helps me create to be so helpful um, and that I get more uh, results that make more sense when I'm standing the patient, if the patient's in reverse turn elevator, oftentimes I see those false positives. Great. Thank you. Um, here's a question. It says, how do you trace varicose veins to primary source on your reports 
when your report is electronic? Um, so I think that uh, our report is electronic. So I showed that um, diagram of the varicose vein. So our reporting system has both a drawing component on it um, that you can freehand. And if you don't have that capability, you can always type. Um, and so I just type out sources. So I will say something similar to varicose veins on the medial thigh appear to be sourced from the great saphenous vein at the proximal thigh. Or I will say varicose veins in the medial calf and lateral calf are sourced from an incompetent perforator 23 centimeters above the medial malleolus, um, something similar to that nature. So you can choose whether you're going to do that in words or with a diagram. All right. And um, we're going to close with this last question, which um, I think is interesting. So uh, once you have found the source of reflux, do you still continue with the rest of the exam? Um, yes, because typically finding the source of reflux for me is at the end. So I've done my mapping. Um, and, you know, when you think about some of the things that we do in our um, reflux study is for insurance requirements. Insurance requirements require you to measure the saphenous thing. Um, they require you to submit diameters and reflux times um, and prove that there's reflux within a segment and that it's large enough for whatever procedure the, the surgeons want to do. Um, and so I continue on with my exam because I want to make sure that I'm looking at every superficial segment and then I'm making sure that I turn my patient completely around in the room. So I'm looking at every side of their leg, uh, visually. And then with ultrasound, I can trace the varicosities to see where they're all coming from. Um, I think it would be difficult to stop the exam at that point and it would probably be a disservice to the patient. Right. Well, thank you, Sarah. You've done an excellent job. You've presented us with a lot of information. Uh, many people have written in questions that we haven't gotten to, and I just want people to know that we will get to your questions and we will individually um, email you your the answer. So I'm going to turn this over to Kelly. She's going to give you some closing uh, information, and uh, I want to thank everyone for attending today. Kelly? Okay, thanks again, everyone, and a very special thank you to our presenter, Sarah Schonsberg. Please feel free to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC webinars portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Tracing the Source of Venous Reflux. Beneath this title, you will see the button Attend Event. Click this button, then the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcripts section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.